Welcome, it's um, 5.33. And good evening, and thank you for joining our uh, virtual community lecture focusing on neck pain and back pain. And my name is Ruth Tesfe. I'm the orthopedic and spine program manager at Little Company Mary Torrance. And we are here joined with, um, with our orthopedic surgeon, Dr. Remy Ajiboye. Before we start, I just wanted to go over a couple of things. Um, just want to let you know that this um, uh, webinar is about an hour long and um, we'll try to end a little bit sooner. So we'll have plenty of time to answer your question. Uh, please uh, type in your questions in the uh, chat box. Um, so, and like I said, we'll try to get through them as many as we can. Um, unfortunately, we are not allowing a participant to speak in this uh, webinar. Uh, before I introduce Dr. Ajiboye, I just wanna let you know a little bit about um, Providence Little Company of Mary Torrance. Um, we uh, treat about, um, over a thousand uh, patients with neck and uh, back pain annually here on average. And then in our Providence, our system, which has over 50 hospitals, we see over 12,000. So we feel very confident we have the resources, the expertise, um, and the, you know, the skills to really uh, able to manage uh, patients' uh, neck and back pain. Uh, lastly, I wanted to tell you that this presentation that we have today is just for educational purposes. Uh, if you have any specific questions, um, specific, you know, to your um, to your medical conditions, uh, please reach out to your healthcare providers so they'll be able to assist you more uh, better. Um, without further ado, I'm pleased to announce Dr. Remy Ajiboye. Um, so I'm going to just read you his bio. Um, Dr. Ajiboye has advanced training in minimally invasive spine surgery and spine reconstruction for a condition involving the cervical, thoracic, lumbar spine, as well as complex spine conditions uh, like sclerosis. He served as a clinical instructor uh, at Stanford University, where he has uh, completed his spine fellowship training. He has a strong interest in new technology and spine research, having written over 40 research papers and book chapters. He completed orthopedic spine residency at UCLA and was uh, appointed as chief residence. Uh, Dr. Ramey uh, Ajiboye has uh, presented his work on spine condition nationally and internationally. Um, he's our co-medical director for spine program here at Little Company, Mary Torrance. He has a specific interest in uh, different ways of decreasing spine related pain and minimally complication of spine surgery. His treatment philosophy is to use most conservative and less invasive means possibly to help relieve pain and improve patient's quality of life. Without further ado, Dr. Ajboye, it's all yours. Uh, thank you, Ruth, uh, for that introduction. Can, can everyone hear me okay? Hopefully. Uh, um, I am going to share my screen now. Uh, let's see here. Excellent. Well, thank, again, again, thanks for uh, uh, Ruth for that excellent introduction. And uh, thanks to the Providence system for putting this uh, great community lecture together. Uh, I'll be discussing um, neck and back pain today. Uh, just sort of give you an introduction to an overview of spine conditions, how I typically evaluate patients with neck and back pain, and what are some of the treatment uh, options that we usually recommend for patients. Uh, as Ruth mentioned, I am the uh, medical director for the orthopedic spine surgery program at the hospital, uh, which is Providence of the Company of Marion Torrance. And we've got a great team uh, of people to work with there uh, that help us del deliver excellent uh, spine care. Uh, just an overview of this presentation today. Uh, I will uh, start off with a basic overview of the anatomy of the spine and go over some of the common causes of uh, neck and back pain. And then uh, we will review uh, uh, what uh, some of the concerning symptoms that patients with neck and back pain typically present with. Uh, we'll go over how I typically evaluate these patients. Uh, we'll go over options for treatment, including non-operative treatment, as well as uh, uh, some minimally invasive spine surgery options. And I'm hoping to sort of wrap up this talk in about 20 to 30 minutes to give us plenty of time uh, to answer questions at the end. So if you have any questions, please type into the chat and then Ruth we will um, help us uh, uh, sort of coordinate uh, answering the questions at the end of the talk. Uh, as we all know, uh, neck and back pain, they're quite common. In fact, it's uh, second only to respiratory infection as a reason why patients will typically visit their primary care doctors. 
Uh, so, you know, I, I would imagine most people in this uh, uh, in this presentation today have probably had an episode or two of neck and back pain at least once in their life that has perhaps uh, made them go see a, a doctor for it. Um, some of the risk factors for neck and back pain, uh, we think by far, we think genetics is by far uh, the, the sort of the biggest contributor to some of these problems. Uh, obviously, uh, we know obesity has a lot to do with it as well as we all get older. Uh, uh, sometimes the muscles uh, in, in, the, in the core muscles and the back muscle can sometimes weaken over time, and that can predispose people to have uh, problems with uh, neck and back pain. Uh, uh, smoking, we think, has a lot to do with neck and back pain as well. It has to do with the fact that nicotine and other uh, uh, smoking products actually um, clog up some of the arteries that supply uh, um, the, uh, blood to the muscles around the spine and can predispose patients to having these issues. Uh, uh, being of male gender is also another risk factor, as well as the type of occupation uh, someone is in. Uh, just a basic anatomy of the spine here, if you guys can see my, um, my mouse pointer, uh, typically we refer to the uh, neck as a cervical spine, uh, which is here. Uh, and then the upper back area is typically what we call the thoracic spine. And then the lower back is what we call the lumbar spine. And then the very, very bottom by the tailbone is what we call the sacrum. So oftentimes you hear, you know, people describe C5 or C6, that stands for cervical five or six. If you hear people say T1 or T2, that's thoracic, and then or lumbar four, lumbar five, that's lumbar. Um, and the way that the, hopefully you guys can see my mouth, uh, my mouse moving here, but on the right side of this picture here, <clears throat> it's kind of the basic anatomy of the nerves in the spine, okay? I like to think of the nerves in the spine, okay? Think of it as a freeway, okay? There's a main freeway, which is the spinal cord and the main spinal column. And this main freeway has an exit on both sides, which are nerve, little nerve branches, okay, off the main spinal column of the spinal cord itself. And so patients can oftentimes present with uh, uh, nerve compression, either at the main freeway, the main spinal column itself, or on the branches of the spinal uh, cord or dura, as we call it, uh, instead. Uh, or, or patients can have compression of the nerve at both sides. Uh, this is just a basic um, uh, MRI of what, what a lower back looks like. So the lumbar spine, okay? If you think of, think of the lower back or each spinal level, whether it's the lower back, upper back of the neck is made up of you know, certain uh, units. Uh, we call the, the front part of the spine, uh, it's typically where we have the vertebrae. The vertebrae is the bone, okay? And that's essentially the building block of the spine itself. They're typically um, you know, shaped almost like a square. In between each of those square bones is where you find the disc. The disc itself is the cushion. It's like a shock absorber between the bones. And then in the back of the spine, you have joints in the back of the spine called facet joints. And these joints are almost like, they're shaped almost like, uh, like hamburger buns. Um, and these are, uh, uh, these are, you know, they serve as a stabilizing force in the back of the spine. Obviously you also have muscles and ligaments in the spine as well. Now, any of these structures, unfortunately can develop problems and can be a source of uh, um, uh, neck and back pain. So we're gonna sort of go over some examples of that, okay? Uh, this is the patient, for example, this is an MRI, okay, of someone, of a patient's back, okay? Uh, the front of the spine is here, okay, and the back of the spine is here. Remember, we talked about the building block of the spine, which are the, the, the vertebral bodies, which are the bones, and then the, the cushion is the disc in between them, okay? And then the nerves are these structures actually way back here, the darker gray structures back here. Those are the nerves in the spine, and then the lighter uh, color that you see uh, it's just a fluid sac called the cerebrospinal fluid that the nerves bathe in. And the cerebrospinal fluid is, is thought to be essentially a, 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 a supplies nutrition to the nerves. So this is an example of a patient, okay, that has a fracture or broken bone in one of the vertebrae, right? So the vertebrae has lost its normal square shape and is now abnormally shaped. Uh, common causes of these can be things like osteoporosis or weakening of the bones which makes the bone extremely brittle and susceptible to having these kind of fractures, okay? Another common cause, we talked about the disc. It's probably the most well-known cause of back problems, okay? The disc itself, again, is, is, is the main cushion or it's something to think of it as the cartilage between the bones. Uh, most people have probably heard of what we call a disc herniation or a quote unquote slipped disc. Um, and I would like to take this time to point out the main difference between a disc herniation or a disc bulge, okay? Think of a disc herniation as a jelly donut, okay? 
And when the jelly donut has a hole in it, it allows the internal jelly contents of the, of the donuts to leak out. And this is an example of what we see here with a patient with a fairly massive herniation, okay, in their lower back. This is in contrast to what we call a disc bulge. Disc bulges are extremely common. You want to think about a disc bulge is, imagine if you have, uh, uh, if you lose a little bit of uh, pressure in, in, in your car tires, right? And the tire starts to bulge out a little bit, okay? So that's the different difference between a disc herniation and a disc bulge. Uh, both can be equally as painful, okay? Uh, a disc herniation oftentimes is more likely to cause actual nerve compression than a disc bulge itself. Disc bulges typically happen as we all get older. Okay, it's just kind of part of the wear and tear of the normal human spine. And it is possible to have many levels with multiple disc bulges and have zero pain with this. It's just a sign of normal wear and tear. In fact, most people that have disc bulges are not aware that they have a disc bulge. When the disc herniates out and compresses the nerve, for example, people can develop what we call sciatica, which most people here have probably heard of. Sciatica itself just refers to the clinical entity of you have a radiating pain that shoots down into your legs, okay? Typically from a uh, pinched nerve in the lower back. And then we use the word stenosis, which is just a medical term. All that means is nerve pinching. So the process of nerve pinching itself is called stenosis. And then the clinical symptoms of having a shooting pain that radiates down into the buttock, thigh, or leg, or foot from a pinch nerve in the back is what we typically refer to as a sciatica. Um, this is another, uh, uh, it's another MRI of a, you know, of a patient that has what we call a slip vertebrae, right? So slip vertebrae means that the, the whole vertebrae itself, as you can see on this MRI here, is actually sliding forward. And part of the reason why that happens, because sometimes the joints at the back of the spine that I, that I referred to earlier called the facet joint, as it becomes more and more arthritic, those joints become enlarged. When they become enlarged, some of the capsule of tissue that stabilizes those joints become very, very loose, which then makes that joint very unstable, right? So we call that a spondylolisthesis. A spondylolisthesis is just a Greek word. The spondyl itself st stands for the vertebrae or the building block. And the listhesis just means slippage. So this is what people oftentimes refer to as a slipped vertebrae, which is different from a slipped disc, which is a disc herniation. Uh, another common cause of neck or back pain are what we call deformity. Okay, a deformity just means it's a it's a malformation or a misshapen spine, right? And so uh, most people here are probably familiar with what we call scoliosis. Okay, scoliosis is a curvature or a sideways curvature of the spine. Um, it's actually quite common. Uh, there are several different types, but the two most common types are what we call idiopathic, and then the other one is called a degenerative scoliosis. Idiopathic means we don't know what causes it. And this is the, the type that people oftentimes develop in your teenage years. Um, oftentimes it will require a brace uh, or just close clinical monitoring. Uh, the other type is what we call degenerative. The degenerative one okay, is because of arthritis or degeneration of the disc. And this typically presents later in life when people would develop this in their 50s and 60s. And this happens because if you imagine the space of the disc, okay, if someone starts to wear out the disc, let's say on one side more than the other, over time, if you add that up over many levels in the spine, it will lead to a gradual, it will lead to a gradual curvature, okay, in the spine. Uh, another type of uh, deformity or uh, we refer to in the spine is what we call kyphosis, which is a curve forward. Uh, oftentimes known as a hunchback. Uh, some patients can develop this congenitally, meaning they're born with it. Uh, others can have it just for bad posture. Um, and then uh, another common cause of it is actually fractures, okay? So in, uh, as people get older, it's very, very easier, uh, easy to uh, fracture some of the bones in the spine, especially in the upper back and the thoracic spine. And if you have a few of these fractures back to back to back, over time, it leads to compression of the front more than the back, which can lead to that in a gradual hunch over in the, in the spine. And that's what we refer to as a kyphosis or a hunchback. And, and this can be a, a very common source of neck or back pain as well. Um, now, in terms of symptoms that we worry about when patients present with neck and back pain, right? We always, we care about radiating symptoms, right? What does a radiating symptom mean? It means, do you have pain that starts in your neck area that shoots down, whether it's pain, numbness, or tingling that shoots down into your shoulders, into the arm or hands, uh, or do you have a similar thing in the lower back that goes into the buttock, the thigh, the leg, or the foot? And this, again, this can be numbness, tingling, or pain. 
Um, when nerves are compressed, they tend to uh, cause a referred pain in a very specific distribution, right? So oftentimes patients would come to my office and say, my hip hurts, something's wrong with my leg. Can you, can you get an MRI of my leg or my hip? And I say, listen, this is not your leg or your hip. This is actually a uh, referred pain from a pinched nerve in your back and it's causing pain to shoot down into, the, into those extremities. Uh, but these are kind of symptoms that we want to know about because this usually will tell us that there's a nerve somewhere that's either getting compressed or there's a nerve somewhere that's uh, uh, under, uh, under a lot of stress or you know, uh, be, uh, inflamed and can cause this, uh, what we call radicular symptoms or radiating symptoms out into the arm uh, or legs. Other symptoms to worry about in patients with neck and back pain, weakness and atrophy, okay? I always counsel patients, never leave your, uh, uh, if you're having symptoms of numbness or tingling, you never wanna wait until the point where you have weakness or atrophy, okay? This is an example of someone with the leg that's completely atrophy, or someone whose muscles in the back of their shoulder here is completely atrophy, right? Atrophy just means shrinkage of the muscle. And the reason why that happens is because the nerve is the command center for the muscles, okay? The nerve tells the muscle to do their job. You can move your arms, your legs, because the nerve tells the muscle to do those things. When the nerve is pinched or compromised, it can no longer do its job. And it's because it's not providing that constant signal to the muscle, the muscle essentially starts to shrink away, okay? And I always tell patients, once you get to the point where you have weakness of atrophy or atrophy, it may be a sign of you know, permanent nerve damage and there's never any guarantee, even if we're going there to relieve the pressure off the nerve, that you can reverse that damage. So we try to counsel patients, you do not want to wait to fix your neck or back. Uh, you don't want to wait uh, uh, to, the, uh, uh, to the point where you start having weakness or atrophy because that's a sign that you probably waited way too long. Uh, obviously, other uh, signs that we worried about are uh, changes to what we call bowel or bladder function, right? So similar to the muscles of the arms or the legs, okay? the bowel, the bladder, uh, these are muscles, okay? And they're also controlled by nerves. The sphincter in the bladder, the sphincter in the anus, these are all controlled by nerves. Similarly to the arms or legs, muscles, right? When these uh, nerves are compromised, they can start to affect people's bowel and bladder function, where people find it hard to empty their uh, bowels or uh, hard to em completely empty their uh, bladder after urination, they have to keep urinating frequently, Obviously, we know, and especially in older men, for example, the prostate can also be a common cause of this. But I always tell patients, make sure you have your nerves look out to, looked at to make sure that you're not having these issues from a, uh, a nerve compromise somewhere in your spine. And sometimes these can actually be um, uh, considered to be emergencies, especially if they happen very acutely. There's a phenomenon known as cauda equina syndrome, which can essentially lead to uh, severe, uh, typically will present a severe back pain and sudden on, uh, onset or loss of bowel or bladder control. These things are considered to be surgical emergencies because uh, if that happens, uh, unfortunately, sometimes the patients never recover some of their bowel and bladder function back. Um, another uh, uh, common uh, symptom we like to uh, assess for uh, or get worried about are problems with coordination, okay? Uh, so if uh, there's an entity called a myelopathy, myelopathy is a, it just means it's a clinical symptom that someone has evidence of spinal cord compression. And this is actually quite common, especially in, in people uh, with nerve compression or spinal cord compression in their neck area. These patients would typically present with difficulty with coordination. So they can't, simple things like button the shirt, uh, they drop things a lot. Uh, they find over time that their handwriting is getting worse. They find that the balance is getting a little bit off. They fall frequently. These are concerning symptoms, right? Because uh, it typically will me means that your spinal cord is under an immense amount of pressure. Uh, and uh, uh, these patients uh, typically uh, need to have something done to relieve pressure on the spinal cord uh, because the spinal cord doesn't tolerate a lot of uh, uh, compression and it doesn't uh, heal very well if it gets affected, right? There's a reason why it's hard to bounce back after a spinal cord injury. Uh, or, or a stroke in the brain, for example. So uh, tissues like the brain and the spinal cord don't regenerate very, very well. Uh, now, another uh, kind of finally, uh, another very uh, concerning symptom I like to ask you know, any patient that comes into my office is what we call constitutional symptoms, okay? These are symptoms like fever, unintentional weight loss, night sweat, nighttime pain, okay? These are symptoms that can, uh, can be a sign of things like cancers or infections in the spine, which is obviously a very serious issue. Uh, most pe people do not know this, but the spine is actually the most common site for cancer spread. 
Okay, so if you have cancer, let's say in the lung or in the liver or in the colon, uh, the spine is the most common site where those cancers can spread to. So oftentimes, patients will actually come see their spine surgeon for a back pain, and that's actually, gonna be, that's actually the first time where they will actually notice that there's actually is cancer in their spine, and they have to go figure out where that cancer came from. And we, you know, we think the reason why this is the case is because the spine itself has a tremendous amount of blood supply in it. And so when cancer is spread, it typically spreads to you know, things like the lymph nodes and lymph or blood. And that, that's why it makes it very easy, uh, an easy site for cancer to spread to. Now, in terms of how we evaluate patients with neck and back pain, um, it's very, very important to see a spine surgeon or a spine specialist and have a thorough uh, history taken and, and have a good phys physical examination done. This is just a sample of, this is actually my intake form for my, for my clinic, okay? And uh, this is the, the first page, okay? This is the first page of my intake form that I have every new patient that comes to see me. I haven't filled this form out. And as you can see here in this area that I circled here in blue, I want to know right off the bat, okay? Are you having problems with your balance? Are you having problems holding onto objects? Do you already have weakness? Do you have any problems with your bladder? I have a nighttime pain or, or, or weight loss, right? Because to me, those are what I consider to be red flag signs. This is the patient I'm going to take and say, listen, you may have something serious going on. We need to act on this and investigate this further, okay? But a good thorough clinical history, right, has to do with, one, how long have you had symptoms for? What activity or positions make it better? What makes it worse? What kind of treatment have you had done for this, right? A lot of that information helps us kind of come up with a good, good clinical picture as to what's going on with the patient. Um, obviously, doing a thorough physical examination um, is also very important. Um, most patients with spine problems, vast majority of the diagnosis can actually be made without a single x-ray. Just by talking to the patient, knowing exactly where their pain is, where the pain is referring to, you can oftentimes tell what the problem may be. Uh, but that's why it's very important to go to actually someone who actually specializes in the spine condition so you can actually get a good thorough evaluation. Um, obviously, to kind of uh, to, to supplement our, our clinical suspicions and to kind of investigate that further, we typically would get other studies like x-rays, which are good uh, to look at uh, kind of general anatomy of the bone of the spine, uh, see if someone has any loss of the cushion space, which is where the disc typically, disc typically is. Uh, we also get things like CAT scans, which gives us, you know, can give us sort of very good uh, uh, pictures of the uh, uh, bony anatomy. And obviously, MRI is actually considered to be the gold standard in evaluating uh, patients with neck and back problems because the MRI gives us a very, very detailed look at the bone, the disc, the nerves, um, and other kind of surrounding structures like soft tissue around the spine area. In terms of how we treat this, um, uh, one of our mainstays of treatment is medication, right? Someone comes in, they're having neck or back pain, try some medication. I'm a big fan of anti-inflammatory medication. Uh, most patients, uh, most processes in the spine that cause pain, it's an inflammatory process, okay? And the best way to get that inflammatory uh, process down is to put patients typically on either steroids or what we call non-steroidal anti-inflammatories. So non-steroidal anti-inflammatories are things like over-the-counter, like Aleve, Advil, Ibuprofen. Um, the stronger version of those obviously is a steroidal, uh, and there's several variations of steroids or cortisone uh, that people can try to help bring the inflammation down. Um, as an adjunct to anti-inflammatory medication, I'm also a big fan of muscle relaxants. And the reason why is because when the spine is inflamed or the nerves are inflamed, the muscles around the neck or the back will spasm in response to that inflammation, okay, which, can basically, which is basically what we call a muscle spasm, right? And oftentimes being on a muscle relaxant along with the anti-inflammatory will, will help to ease that tension in that area. Uh, for patients with a lot of uh, uh, numbness type feeling or tingling on their legs, uh, neuropathic medications can also be very helpful. These are things like gabapentin or Lyrica. Uh, these are medications that are meant to essentially help the nerves sort of heal and recover. Obviously, we try not to prescribe opioids for patients. Uh, while they can be very helpful, we all know that these medications can be very addicting. Uh, there's a whole national opioid crisis. And I always remind patients, Opioids do nothing to actually treat the, uh, the source of the pain, right? Opioids work by tricking the brain to not experience the sensation of pain itself. It does nothing at the actual source of the pain to bring the pain down, right? And that's why anti-inflammatories are so important because the anti-inflammatories actually act at the source of the pain itself to bring the inflammation and the pain down from where it's coming from. 
Obviously, most people here are familiar with physical therapy. I think physical therapy is a must for anyone with neck or back pain. And the idea is that therapy focuses on a lot of stretching and strengthening. And the idea is that if you can build some of the muscles around the spine, if you can uh, uh, build them up, uh, they serve almost like a natural brace and protects your spine from a lot of biomechanical stresses. Um, acupuncture, I love acupuncture. I cannot tell you how acupuncture works. I know it works. Um, there are tons of amazing acupuncture practitioner, uh, practitioners in, in the South Bay. And uh, the whole idea or concept behind acupuncture, it has to do with energy flow. Um, it, I'm a big fan of acupuncture. I prescribe these you know, modalities uh, literally uh, probably 20, 30 times a week to patients. So I'm a big fan of acupuncture for patients with neck and back pain. Um, most people are also familiar with chiropractic adjustments. Uh, the chiropractors kind of focus more on you know, soft tissue mobilization and manipulation of, of some of the joints uh, and soft tissue and can be a great adjunct for patients having a lot of neck and back problems as well. Uh, uh, now, spinal injections, uh, these are typically done by pain management uh, doctors. Uh, and the idea of a, a spinal injection, uh, uh, most people are probably familiar with the cortisone injection or what we call the epidural steroid injection. And the idea is that you want to uh, 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 directly deliver an anti-inflammatory steroid and an anesthetic medication directly at the source of the pain, right? This can be done to the back, around the disc area, around a nerve that's inflamed or compressed. And the idea is that it helps to kind of uh, bring the pain and inflammation now uh, better at these sites and sometimes works better than something orally. Uh, you know, it's, 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 it's a procedure that's typically done in the surgery center. Sometimes the pain management doctors will do it in their office. So I always tell patients, at least try the oral anti-inflammatories first, try things like physical therapy and the acupuncture and the chiropractor. If this things don't work, you can always escalate your care to try these injections. Um, nowadays, obviously, most people here are probably familiar with the idea of uh, PRP, or called platelet-rich plasma and stem cells. Um, the data on this is still quite controversial. Uh, PRP is essentially you take a patient's blood, okay? You put it in a tube and put it through what we call a centrifuge, which basically spins the blood. And the idea is that you can separate the different contents in a patient's blood. The area that's, uh, that we're really interested in is this area called a platelet-rich plate, plate, plate plasma. And the idea is that this uh, platelet-rich plasma, or PRP, contains certain growth factors, which are like proteins, which help to signal to the body to undergo a healing process. So, in, you know, oftentimes people try an, uh, a steroid injection first to bring the inflammation down. And then to, as a way to sort of speed up the healing process, they can sometimes get PRP injections to help the healing process. Stem cells kind of work in a similar way, except that they're, you know, they're stem cells. They're what we call progenital cells, which are cells that are capable of, um, of replacing other cells that may be damaged. And the idea is that, you know, using some of these modalities like PRP or stem cell can help to speed up the healing process in patients with, with neck and back pain. Obviously, the data is still um, quite controversial on this. And oftentimes, a lot of insurance companies will actually not cover the, cover the treatments. So I always tell patients, if you have the means and you can afford it and the price is reasonable, uh, it's worth a try to see if it helps uh, alleviate some of, uh, some of the neck and back problems. Obviously, as a last resort, uh, 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 surgery can also be considered, uh, especially for patients with concerning symptoms like, you know, patients with infections, patients with things like cancers or tumors in their spine, people with weakness or atrophy, people having worsening numbness or tingling, which is typically a sign of a nerve that's under a lot of pressure, people with having changes in their bowel or bladder function, or people at risk for having, you know, severe permanent nerve damage. Uh, surgery can certainly be considered for some of these patients, um, if you know, if uh, and also for other patients who have filled non-surgical options and nothing else is making them feel better. Um, when surgery is considered, I, I, I'm a believer in minimally invasive spine surgery and the concept of it. Uh, my practice is uh, primarily focused on minimally invasive spine surgery, and the idea is that this is essentially an alternative to traditional open spine surgery. Uh, obviously, not every patient is a candidate, but whenever possible, I try to stick by the principles of minimal invasive spine surgery uh, to get the job done to relieve pressure on the nerve. And the idea behind minimal invasive spine surgery is that you know, through smaller incisions, oftentimes less than an inch incisions, uh, you can get a lot of work done to free up a nerve. Um, and you know, the small incision leads to less blood loss, leads to less scar tissue formation, 
It also leads to less pain because you're not dissecting off all their muscles in their back and, and essentially you know, destroying the blood supply. And this typically leads to shorter stays in the hospital and patient, patients are able to return back to a lot of their normal activities a lot sooner compared to the traditional spine surgery, for example. Um, with minimal invasive spine surgery, we can achieve all the same goals of traditional back surgery, which typically are involved in you know, a nerve decompression, you know, stabilizing the spine with fusion. And, and another uh, uh, component of minimal invasive spine surgery is the whole idea of uh, motion preservation, which are typically what we call artificial disc replacement. Now, uh, I don't know if most people here are familiar with it, but the idea of artificial disc replacement, it, 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 this technology was um, invented because some people believe that in patients that undergo spinal fusion, which is you basically put screws and rods uh, to immobilize a certain segment of the spine, the idea is that if you immobilize that one joint and you fuse it together, the joint above or below now has to make up with that loss of motion of that fuse joint. So the joint above and below now has to work harder because they have to make up for the fuse one, right? And the idea is that perhaps these joints will uh, deteriorate a lot faster than normal because now they have to work twice as hard. This is still a controversial topic. Um, you know, there are people that believe that it doesn't matter if you do a fusion or not, that some people are prone to having degeneration in the joints in their spine. So whether or not you do a fusion or not fusion, if you have a problem in, in um, at L4-5, years later, you're going to have one at L5-S1 or the one above it at L3-4. But the whole concept of artificial disc replacement, you know, it's, it's meant to sort of solve some of those problems. There's great results for artificial disc replacement, especially in the cervical spine and neck area. The data in the lower back, the lumbar spine, is still controversial. And I've, I've, and I've written several papers on this as well. Uh, and I've had very good results using this in the, in, in, in the neck and in the right patient demographic. Um, in the lower back, again, the data is still not quite um, uh, clear as to if it, if it truly benefits patients or not. Um, some of the other technologies that we use to achieve uh, minimally vision spine surgery are things like robotics, right? So this is a robotic machine. Uh, that uh, essentially uh, has a uh, robotic arm that allows us to place screws uh, into the spine, for example, through a small incision. Uh, and these screws are kind of uh, templated off uh, uh, a, a CAT scan, an intraoperative CAT scan, which allows us to basically put these screws into a small incision in a very precise way so you don't you know, hit the nerve and things like that. Uh, we also have things called intraoperative navigation system, which is like a uh, it looks like a video game, really, honestly. Um, it's, uh, it's like a GPS system uh, that essentially tells you where you are in place, uh, in space, excuse me, and allows us to, again, place screws and, you know, other instrumentation into the spine in a very safe manner because you can actually, you can look right on the screen and it tells you exactly where you are in real time. Again, these are all things that we do, uh, that we use to basically help us uh, perform surgery, a minimal invasive spine surgery in a very safe and efficacious manner. Um, Another component of uh, minimally invasive spine surgery that I do is this concept of awake spine surgery. And I use the word awake in quotation. Uh, most people, when they hear this, actually get scared. They say, listen, I don't want to be awake during my spine surgery. And I tell these patients, no, you don't actually need to be awake. The idea of awake spine surgery is that you know, anyone here, I'll, I'll guarantee you, anyone here or anyone that you know of that's ever had spine surgery had it done with general anesthesia, which is a tube down into their throat. Uh, this is a surgery that I learned when I was at Stanford from one of my mentors. And the idea is that you can, we can do the surgeries with a local anesthesia, which is just to numb up the back area. And then uh, working with the anesthesiologist, we can give a patient just a little bit of a light sedation, kind of similar to undergoing a colonoscopy, for example. And uh, we can do compressed nerves. We can do spinal fusions this way. Uh, and the reason why I like this uh, um, uh, uh, technique is that one, it minimizes a lot of narcotic use because right then and there, I'm able to uh, apply the local anesthesia to basically block the areas of pain in the spine to get the surgery done. And also it, it, it avoids a lot of the grogginess feeling um, and that sick feeling patients oftentimes get after general anesthesia. When patients have awake spine surgery, they're oftentimes literally walking within half an hour after surgery. Because again, they don't have that groggy feeling of, the, of having general anesthesia. Uh, this is something I'm starting to do more and more at Providence Little Company at Marion Torrance. Again, I learned from one of my mentors at Stanford. There's only a handful of surgeons in the country that do this. And I think it's a great option, especially for some of my older patients, for example, who I think you know having general anesthesia might be too much of a high risk for them. So 
for whether for health reasons or people with underlying dementia. Um, again, I think this is a great option uh, for so that group of patients. Um, in terms of take-home points from this lecture, um, I think uh, uh, in patients experiencing uh, uh, you know, neck or back pain, I think it is important to undergo a thorough evaluation uh, with a spine surgeon, uh, especially if you're having persistent and concerning symptoms, things like numbness, tingling, uh, or weakness. Um, I think it's important to have it, this evaluated by a specialist. Um, the vast majority, I mean, 90 something percent of patients with neck and back problems never require surgery, nor do they need surgery. Most of them get better without surgical intervention, right? Things like medications, the therapy, the acupuncture, the chiropractor, the injections oftentimes help this patient get better. Uh, surgery really is only reserved for patients who have uh, failed or exhausted non-surgical treatment options or patients who obviously have concerning red flag symptoms, right? Those who already have weakness or have, uh, you know, at risk of having permanent nerve damage. Um, and when surgery is considered, I, I'm a big believer in minimally invasive spine surgery. I think it's a better option uh, compared to the traditional way of doing uh, open spine surgery because of the uh, uh, you know, less risk of complication, decreased bleeding risk, and faster recovery. Um, thank you all. And uh, I'll use this time to take some questions. All right. Well, thank you, Dr. Ajboye. That was very informative. Uh, and I'm so glad you said, you know, because a lot of people, um, when they hear neck and uh, back problem, they automatically assume it's going to be the only option they have is surgery. So uh, surgery is the last option, not the first option. So um, thank you for bringing that up there. Um, so before we start with our Q&A, we have a few questions, but I wanted to ask you guys if you could answer the poll on your screen, what you see there. Uh, we really appreciate it. And please give us your honest feedback uh, because we really want to do a, a good job in presenting uh, for a future lecture. Uh, so thank you. Um, so now uh, let me open up some question here. Um, so um, one of the questions, uh, Dr. Ajaboy says that I was wondering which medication for osteoporosis are the best with the least amount side effect. So that's a that's a great question. Um, so I'm a big uh, I, as a spine surgeon and an orthopedic surgeon. I actually, I know a bit more about osteoporosis than probably most. Um, when I was at UCLA, I spent about a year in an osteoporosis clinic with an endocrinologist. Um, so uh, I'm pretty familiar with some of the medications. Now, these are typically treated by either primary care doctor or endocrinologist. Uh, there are several classes of osteoporosis uh, uh, medications. Now, people know osteoporosis is just to kind of define that for everyone just means weakening of the bones in the, in, in the, in the, in the, in the body, okay? And uh, one of the ways that's typically diagnosed is something with something called a bone density scan or a DEXA scan. And it typically will check things like your back, your hip, oftentimes your wrist area uh, as a way to um, uh, assess the quote unquote density of your bone. And this, uh, whatever the measure, it's compared to typically someone in their mid thirties. So most of us, your peak bone, the best quality of bone you're going to have in life is going to be in your 30s. After that, it goes downhill. And with women, especially after menopause, the quality of the bone deteriorates even faster. Okay, so women are typically at a higher risk for having osteoporosis than men. Why is osteoporosis important? Okay, osteoporosis, especially if, uh, 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 if you have a, a fall, for example, uh, most people here probably know of someone who has had a fall in their 60s, 70s, 80s, and broke a hip, okay? A hip fracture, the, the, the risk of dying within two to three years after a hip fracture is about 30%, okay? And that's because it just, it takes a lot out of you, right? You're mobilizing the bed, the recovery, people get infections, pneumonias, right? So that's why osteoporosis is important. And I oftentimes will counsel my patients when I see them and say, listen, looking at your x-ray, I can tell your bone is not in great shape. Talk to your endocrinologist, talk to your primary care doctors to make sure that something gets done with your bone quality so you don't fall and break a hip or break a you know, part of the spine, uh, part of the bones in your spine. Now, there are different classes of osteoporosis medications, okay? There are typically pills that can be taken. Uh, the most common ones are called bisphosphonates, right? There are pills that can be taken daily, uh, weekly, uh, those bisphosphonates are also options for them to get in, uh, infusions where you can do a once a year infusion, for example, right? So that's called Zometa. There are other ones uh, um, like Fosamax, for example, that are also quite common. Uh, 
they've, they've been around the longest and they're the cheapest ones, to be honest with you. And so a lot of insurance companies will oftentimes push their primary care doctors and endocrinologists to make sure patients are on these bisphosphonates as a first line treatment. The downside with, of these medications are that they can sometimes be as, associated with what we call jaw osteonecrosis, meaning that it interferes with uh, bone remodel in the jaw. Uh, with some of the pills, it creates a lot of gastrointestinal side effects. And then this medication oftentimes will actually cause what we call atypical hip fractures. So if you've been on it for more than five years, you're actually supposed to stop it and switch to a different class of medication because the way the medication works is basically there's cells in the bone that build bone and there's cells in the, in the bone that destroy bones. And you constantly go into this remodeling process. It's kind of like skin cells, right? You're constantly forming new skin and you know getting rid of old skin. With the osteoporosis medication like bisphosphonates, it slows down the bones that actually, so it slows down the cells that actually break down bone. And so you actually get too much of the cells that builds up bone in an ironic way, actually makes your, uh, your, uh, your bone more brittle, kind of like a ceramic, right? If you drop a ceramic on the floor, it's gonna, it's, it's gonna break, right? And so we've uh, found that in patients that are on bisphosphonates, you, you wanna put a more called a drug holiday. So you don't wanna be on bisphosphonates for more than five years. You, you, know, you wanna stop it and switch to a different class. The other classes, I'm, I'm a person, a big fan of one called Prolia. Uh, it's one that's typically done every six months. Uh, it, it works pretty well. Um, there's also another one called Forteo. Uh, Forteo is kind of unique and there's a newer one called Timulus, which is very similar to Forteo. The problem with these medications are they are daily injections. And, uh, you know, we it, it's kind of cumbersome to have to inject yourself daily with a medication to build up your bone. Um, but again, I, I think for most people, I think an entry-level medication should probably be the bisphosphonates. Uh, and some patients that may want to consider maybe the Prolia, which is a once every six-month injection. I think the daily injections are a little bit too much uh, for most people. And it's very, very expensive. An insurance company typically would not cover the price because oftentimes it can be, I think, two to three thousand dollars a month for these for the for the daily injections. All right. Um. Thank you. I think you touched on this one here, but the next question says, can massage, ultrasound, acupuncture could be beneficial? Absolutely, absolutely. And so things like massage helps a lot with you know soft tissue mobilization, uh, which can help with with neck and back pain. Uh, like I said, I, I'm a big fan of acupuncture. I don't know how it works, but I know it works. I prescribe it routinely in my in my clinic, um, and ultrasound is a you know it, it's a great modality as well. A lot of physical therapy locations or practitioners will use ultrasound treatment as part of their um, uh, 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 treatment modality. Uh, I think those are all good things that that work. Uh, another common one is a tens unit, which most people can probably order on uh, um, uh, on Amazon. Uh, it's just a, it's electrical stimulation across the muscle area. Can also be a, a great way to uh, treat neck and back pain. And that's called TENS, T-E-N-S, TENS unit. Okay. Uh, the next question is, says, can the injection relieve back pain? I think you mentioned that. And how mm -hmm. long would the pain relief last? So that's a great question. That's a very <laughs> common question that I uh, you know, get asked by patients. If I get an epidural injection, how long will it last? And I, the first thing I tell a patient is, if you have pain and you take ibuprofen, how long is that going to last for? No one knows, right? Yeah. So um, you, you can certainly try it, uh, but no, there's no um, specific time and it's, it's going to last, right? And some of the efficacy of the injection also may have to do with how compressed or irritated an epi, you know, a nerve is, right? If you have a nerve that's severely compressed, the chances of an epidural injection really doing much to that nerve, it's probably low, right? So it's like having bone on bone arthritis in your knee or hip, right? Because when you get a cortisone shot, uh, but unfortunately, you know, once, once that cortisone shot wears off, you still have bone-on-bone -bone severe arthritis, right? And you can never mm -hmm. guarantee how long that relief is gonna, really going to last for. Again, a lot of that has to do with the severity of the problem itself. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, someone wanted to know that I guess they have some issue with their neck and their neck, um, I guess, to be comfortable, it's always uh, in an extended position. And now um, they're having some back issues. So um, do you have any suggestions? You know, what is the treatment? I apparently sounds like it's a shoulder problem and then ended up being now a neck problem. So do you have yeah. any? So yeah, so there's a whole entity, for example, called hip spine syndrome, 
Meaning patients have hip problems and you think it's the hip, but it's actually the back. You think it's the back, it's actually the hip. A similar entity kind of hap- occurs for the neck where people go come in for the neck. It's actually their shoulder or they have a shoulder problem. It's actually their neck that's causing the problem. And a lot of the ways we figure it out has to do with the exams that we do. Uh, MRIs, for example, or you know, what we'll call um, uh, diagnostic injections, right? So if I think, okay, I've looked everywhere. I'm not quite sure what's causing it. If I think it's coming from the shoulder, we give you a shoulder injection. If that makes the pain go away, it's probably coming from the shoulder. Uh, if you think it's the neck, get a neck injection. If it helps the neck feel better, it's probably coming from the neck. Oftentimes, believe it or not, patients may actually have both. Now, you know, with, with uh, sort of degree of pain someone is having, your body will always try to compensate, mm-hmm. right? Your body's going to alter its posture to essentially make you, you know, walk around or lay down in the most comfortable position that causes the least amount of pain. The problem is that that compensatory posture that you develop in to alleviate pain might be putting pressure on other joints, right? So we always see people with like, you know, you've got a hip problem, right? And now you start tilting the other way to avoid pressure on that, you know, right hip that's bothering you. Before you know it, you start having problems on the left side because now you put a lot of stress on the joint on the other side, right? So for those patients, I always tell them, it's actually important. You want to address the underlying cause because you're just shifting your problems from one joint to another joint and causing more problems. So if you think it's the neck that's causing a problem, take care of the neck, make the neck feel better. You can lay in a better position, stand in a better position. And that will usually, you know, relieve the, the pain and pressure in the other, you know, body parts. Okay. Uh, the next question says that what remedies are available for nerve condition that causes partial uh, loss of bladder control? So um, it depends um, on which nerve is causing the loss of the bladder control. Right. So if we think if you think the, the actual nerves in your spine itself are actually completely compressed and it's causing lots of bladder control, then you want to take the pressure off that nerve. Right. So bladder control and bowel control are some of those things that, you know, if you lose it, you may never get back. Right. So those, those are things we consider, to be, you know, very seriously. Uh, obviously, there's there are nerves that are outside of the spine itself. Right. So the nerve, the main command center of the nerves are in this, you know, the, it starts off in the brain. And it becomes a spinal cord and it becomes a bunch of nerve branches, right? So outside of the spine, nerves can also get compressed. And, uh, and I know some of our urology colleagues, for example, they have a, you know, uh, surgeries and procedures that they do for patients that are having problems with their bladder control, for example, to basically help to re innervate those bladder, uh, the, the bladder muscles. But again, it has to, you, know, you have to figure out where exactly is the nerve problems that our bladder coming from? Is it in the spine or is it outside of the spine? And that's how you determine how you actually treat or address it. Okay. Um, the next question says, can steroid cause sepsis? Can what? Can steroid cause sepsis? <laughs> it's mm-hmm. a rare complication. Okay. Mm-hmm. So the, um, you know, in, I, I've, I've treated patients with, uh, that have had epidural injections before that ended up developing what we call a discitis or osteomyelitis. A discitis just means uh, infection of the disc osteomyelitis refers to uh, infection of the bone itself. So steroids are anti-inflammatory, right? And the idea is that they essentially cause a local immunosuppression, right? They kind of they suppress your immune cells. If for some reason during the process of getting that steroid done, the area wasn't sterilized properly, because remember, they're bacteria that naturally live on your skin, for example, right? So if that area is not sterilized properly, when the, when the pain doctor puts that needle into your spine for the epidural, they can inadvertently introduce a bacteria into the into the spine area, okay? And then this can, um, uh, with the combination of the steroids, which then suppresses your immune system, so your immune system cannot fight that bacteria, it can actually lead to an infection. Again, extremely rare, uh, but I've seen this happen plenty of times. Okay. Uh, next question, it says, is LDN effective for chronic pain inflammation? It's what? Sorry, I don't, I don't know. I don't know what. LD... I don't know. It says here LDN. I don't know what it stands for. Yeah, I'm not sure what LDN. <laughs> okay, sorry. So we're gonna skip to the next one. Maybe it sounds like low dose something. I don't, I'm not sure what that is. Uh, yeah, it just says LDN. Um, the next question says: After two prostate cancer uh, surgeries and history of low back pain, uh, would you recommend uh, testing for a you know enlarged prostate or back problem? Because I guess they're still having a problem with the back. Well, 
in a way, this should not be related, right? So the prostate cancer, um, well, only way it could be related is if you have prostate cancer that's gone into the spine, for example, right? That's metastasized to the spine, which, you know, a, a urologist sort of figured out or diagnosed on a routine screening for prostate cancer. Um, it's possible, and again, back pain is extremely common, okay? Um, in the absence of prostate cancer and the presence of prostate cancer, people can still have back pain. Um, but the back pain itself should not be responsible for the prostate cancer. And the only way the prostate cancer can be responsible for the, for the back pain will be if it was a, you know, cancer that has spread to the spine area, for example. Um, yeah. uh, well, this next question, I, I love to ask you this question. Uh, Shri, there's a patient who's scheduled to have minimally invasive surgery with you and is asking uh, at what point are you gonna decide whether it's gonna be minimally invasive surgery or it's gonna to convert to open surgery? Yeah, so a lot of that decision that we make, you know, has to do with the individual patient's problem, right? And the anatomy. Um, again, our goal is to always try the minimally invasive approach whenever possible. Uh, in some patients, uh, that's just not possible. You have to really, so for example, uh, I do a lot of scoliosis correction in the, in the lumbar spine, the lower back, for example, through minimally invasive means where I go from the side of the spine and we put the spacers in there to essentially take a spine as a disc space that's like this to prop it up this way to straighten out the spine. And in some of those patients, we can also, you know, after you do that, you have to put screws in through the back, for example. We can put those screws in through small little incisions at about a centimeter or so. In some patients, you actually have to go a little bit higher than normal because of their anatomy or their deformity and how much correction you need to, you need to do to basically get their spine in a, in a good position. And so, uh, but again, a lot of that stuff, we try to, in most patients, uh, I know, it, I would tell them that either the preoperative visit on the day of surgery, exactly what I'm doing. Uh, it's rare that I would change course while I'm in surgery uh, I'm pretty meticulous and I do, I have to do a bunch of measurements and things like that to come up with my final plan. And usually my plan is ready before the day of the surgery. Okay. Um, and the next question says, how long is the minimal invasive surgery takes? It depends on what kind of surgery, mm -hmm. right? So you could do a, like a micro discectomy surgery, which is a, one of the most commonly performed surgeries for a, a, a disc herniation, for example. Um, that we do in spine surgery, those surgeries take about half an hour, okay? Through a small incision, I, I close the incision with a with the dissolvable suture and a glue and a regular bandage over that area. Um, I also do minimally invasive surgery. I do minimally invasive scoliosis surgery that can take six hours. So again, it just depends on, uh, you know, what kind of surgery you're doing. Are you doing what we call a decompression surgery, which is just to take the pressure off the nerve? Are you doing a fusion surgery in a minimally invasive fashion that involves putting screws in which obviously takes more time. How many joints are you working on? Are you working on one joints, two, three, four, five joints? There's so many variables um, mm -hmm. that can involve. Um, all right, thank you. Um, I just want us to keep going. We have about four minutes and we have about 12 questions. So we'll try to get us, you know, <laughs> through those questions as much as possible. Uh, can a frozen shoulder be cause of back pain? Typically not, but typically okay. not. Um, Frozen shoulders are extremely common, uh, common in patients with di in diabetics, for example, uh, patients with uh, uh, other underlying shoulder problems that basically makes them not move their shoulder as much. And then the idea is that capsule, which are the, it's like a soft tissue around the joint, basically will stiffen up over time. The best way to treat it, aggressive, extensive physical therapy to restore that motion back. Okay, and um, next one is, um... Uh, what do you feel is the best approach to treat a de de uh, degenerative disc in the lower back? I already done physical therapy and says it got worse. So a degenerative disc, it's a normal part of the aging process, okay? Every single person on earth will get a degenerative disc as we all get older, right? It's like a wrinkle in the skin, right? Everyone is going to get it. It's like a, mm -hmm. if you look at any joint in the human body, wrist, shoulder, hip, knee, over the years, it's going to degenerate. Most patients that have that may not necessarily have pain from it, right? Mm -hmm. The patients that have pain from it are the ones you want to figure out, okay, how do we make your pain better, right? If all you have is back pain without leg pain or shooting pain onto your legs or buttock area, 
Uh, this is a patient that typically will benefit from medications and therapies and acupuncture and the chiropractor, even injections, for example. Again, some patients may choose to do things like PRP and having a stem cell in that area to see if it helps. Um, and again, I'm, I'm, those are modalities that I'm, that I'm open to for patients to try. Um, but we don't typically just do surgeries for just a degenerative disc. Um, it, it's not recommended. Okay, and this the next two questions, so I'm going to mix it. I mean, I'm going to combine it together. Uh, one is asking, is a, a Vista good for osteoporosis? And then the other one, uh, would you recommend, uh, also, when do you recommend Fosomax for osteoporosis? So I do not know a visa. Uh, I'm not sure what that is. Uh, again, the, the endocrinologists are actually the, the true specialists of osteoporosis. I'm just a, a dorky spine surgeon with a special interest in osteoporosis. <laughs> but if you want to, like, if you, have, if you have any questions on sort of the latest, greatest meds for osteoporosis, those are uh, best addressed by the endocrinologists, which are actually hormone doctors. Because believe it or not, hormones are responsible for maintaining the bone quality in the human body. Um, so I don't know what a visa is, but the second question was about Fosamax. Uh, Fosamax. Yeah. About when it? do you, when do you recommend for use of Fosamax for osteoporosis? I, I think for, I think most primary care doctor, again, I don't prescribe these. I, you know, I, I will tell them I, well, what I think about it. And ultimately I leave it up to the primary care doctors and endocrinologists to prescribe it. But most insurance companies, and unfortunately we have to do a lot of things in medicine because of insurance companies, but mm. most insurance companies will want a patient to start off on Fosamax or, uh, or that class of medication called a bisphosphonate, and unless they have a side effect from it, like a lot of GI um, gastrointestinal problems from it, uh, or they have some you know, other, other side effects from it, um, that's the only way for the insurance company to, to, to say, okay, we're gonna approve you to try a different line of medication, for example. But I would say for most people, I think Fosamax is probably like the, the entry level, sort of first line option for, for osteoporosis uh, treatment. Um, somebody's asking, do you know anything about uh, tarragon? Um, says I created an up and an up, I think, uh, to help with uh, short term pain for hip, calf, and tie. So it's asking you, do you know anything about this new device? Uh, no, I do not. Um, I uh, there are tons of apps out there um, and companies out there that, that focus on a lot of mindfulness uh, to help patients with chronic pain to help patients with um, uh, uh, even post-operative pain, for example. In fact, a, a, a friend of mine developed, uh, has a company that I sort of helped uh, help with uh, that they're, uh, they're, it's an app-based technology uh, with mindfulness and pain control that's used for patients undergoing spine surgery or you know, hip or knee replacement surgery. Uh, basically helps you sort of focus and, 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 um, and uh, uh, process uh, pain uh, and the idea is that this helps with decrease needs for uh, opioids and, and, and things like that after surgery. Okay. And this is going to be the last question. I know we're running out of time here. Um, a patient is asking, a patient has stenosis, severe nerve pinch, lower lumbar region uh, uh, per MRI. What are your thoughts on the uh, vertiflex insert on the option to relieve the nerve compression? Yeah, Vertiflex, unfortunately, it's a small little device. Um, it looks like a, like a paperclip. Uh, in fact, when Vertiflex was first invented, I, I was part of a team when I was at UCLA that actually, I think we put the first ones in on the West Coast. Um, it's a small device that goes between the, what we call the spinous process, which is the bone in the back of the spine. And the idea is, the idea is you put this little thin in there to prop up the spinous process. Uh, unfortunately, it doesn't work. In fact, I did actually I did a surgery on a guy last week, Thursday, who had a vertiflex in there um, that was put in for spinal stenosis, and it made zero difference. Uh, when your nerve is severely compressed, you cannot physically open up space for the nerve with a device that looks like a paperclip. Um, it just doesn't happen. And so, when when that device was actually initially invented, it was marketed to spine surgeons, and uh, spine surgeons actually abandoned it because we just thought it wasn't getting the job done. And so it's actually now marketed more to pain management doctors. And so uh, this is typically done by pain management doctors. Uh, unfortunately, it, it's worth a try, um, you know, but uh, I, I always tell patients, have your doctor order an MRI afterwards and see what happens. All right. Well, thank you. Uh, that will be, uh, we're running out of time. Unfortunately, we just have a few more questions. So we haven't. Um, so I want to thank everyone for taking the time to listen and ask questions. Uh, a big thanks to you, Dr. Ajiboye, uh, for this very informative and uh, very um, entertaining uh, uh, session. 
uh, we'll be sending the recording to everybody uh, for you to keep. Um, and we're also posting this on our Facebook uh, page for everyone to um, able to review and share. Uh, you can find us at uh, Little Company Mary of uh, South Bay uh, for the any additional information on scheduling of uh, physician appointment. Please re, um, visit our website, uh, providence.org, uh, and then you'll be able to have access to all the information. Uh, with that, I want to thank everyone and um, good night and all. have the rest of good night. Thank you all. Thank you for your time. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.